Let the good news come now, O Father, but not with words. Send your good news with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, as we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, we have spent the summer studying the book of 1 Thessalonians. That's one of the more obscure books in the New Testament, but it's been worth looking at. Partly because 1 Thessalonians is the first of the letters that Paul wrote that we have in the New Testament. In fact, 1 Thessalonians is the oldest book in the New Testament. It was the first one to be written roughly about 20 years or so after Jesus' resurrection. So it offers for us the best first-hand glimpse that we have into what Christian faith was like in those early years. Now, I have a theory about how Paul wrote this letter. And in order to follow me on this theory, you need to keep two things in mind. First, Paul couldn't visit Thessalonica. Uh, we don't know. For some reason, he wasn't able to go there. Uh, in chapter 2, I think we even read, he said, Satan prevented me from coming, if you remember that. And at one point, he sent Timothy to go as his representative. But then he decided, maybe the best thing for me to do is to write a letter, which is 1 Thessalonians, what we just read. And Paul continued that practice throughout his life until he died, because there were lots of churches that he started and knew about that he wanted to communicate with. And so he sent letters to them, and we can be glad he did, because those letters make up a lot of what is now our New Testament. The problem he had was there was no postal service back then. You couldn't just put a stamp on an envelope and someone would come by in a cute little truck and pick it up for you. You had to rely on personal couriers or on uh, private connections. So Paul likely knew that there was someone headed to Thessalonica who could carry his letter for him. But what that meant was he had a deadline. He had to finish his letter before that person left. So that's the first thing. Paul couldn't visit, so he had to write to them. The second thing to remember is Paul didn't have paper. We are blessed with this very inexpensive stuff to write on. They didn't have that back then. Paul had two choices for what he could write on. The first is called papyrus. And to make papyrus, you get the reeds out of a swamp called the papyrus reed. That's where it gets its name. And you kind of split it open, and you flatten it down, and then you put others crossways, and you press it together, and then that's what you write on. How easy do you think that is? Not easy. How expensive do you think papyrus was? Very expensive. The other choice he had was parchment. Parchment was specially prepared leather. How easy do you think it was to do that? How expensive do you think that was? Pretty much. So, whether you're writing in papyrus or parchment, we don't know which one Paul originally wrote this in, you needed to use it carefully. You would fill up every space on that parchment or papyrus with what you're writing. So, in other words, first, Paul had to send his letter with a courier, and secondly, he had to conserve how much space he had to write his letter with. Now, meaning no disrespect for Paul, and of course no disrespect for the Holy Spirit who inspired him, Paul did not budget his time and space very well. He started his letter and got carried away with a great detail about the first several topics he wanted to write about. And that's good news for us because now we have that that we can study and we can learn a lot about. But then Paul started to get toward the end of the space that he could write in. And he had a courier sitting out there cooling his heels, waiting for him so he could get going on his trip. So Paul had to cram his final thoughts into whatever space he had left on that parchment or papyrus while, the, while he was waiting for the uh, courier. So what we end up with at the end of 1 Thessalonians, what we read together with Sue leading us, seems more like a laundry list of things to think about than a full explanation about each of them. It's a series of short sayings similar to what we find in the book of Proverbs, which we also read. These are things that Paul wanted to tell the Thessalonians, but he didn't have the time and space to elaborate on it. So if I'm right in my theory about this is how Paul finished 1 Thessalonians, and I'll admit there's a good chance I'm wrong about it, I'm going to do something rather presumptuous. I'm going to fill in the gaps of what Paul wanted to say but didn't have room and time to write it in. I'm imagining what would have Paul written 
I'm going to take each of his one-liners and kind of imagine the thought that Paul had behind each of them. So here we go. The first one actually is a little bit more than one line. This might be before Paul realized, hey, I'm running out of room. Admonish those who work hard among you. Admonish means to impart an understanding of the faith and also to encourage people to live lives according to our faith. So um, acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. So what he is saying, first of all, is something to those who are in leadership in the church, which for us would be myself, the elders, the deacons, our music leaders, our teachers. If you're in leadership, first of all, notice we work hard. Don't slack off and just think, eh, never mind, not going to do it. But remember, the hard work you're doing as a leader in our church is to care for the congregation, to care for those who are with us, and yes, to admonish, to instruct and encourage. If you're not in leadership, your role is to do your best to support those who are in leadership. We're all doing this together. That's something, by the way, we Presbyterians really emphasize, that it's not like you have the clergy way up there, the pastors who are somehow, I don't know, superhumans or whatever, and then there's everyone else down here. Whether you're pastor, elder, deacon, church member, whatever else, we're all in this together. Some of us have leadership roles. If you're in a leadership role, work hard. Remember you're caring for people. Remember to instruct and encourage in the faith. If you're not in a leadership position, respect those who are in leadership. Show love for them. Do what you can for us to be cooperative together. Next, live in peace with each other. Well, that sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? What Paul's writing about here is not some passive, just be at peace, don't cause problems, just, you know, be nice with people. Don't cause any issues. That's not what he's talking about here. He's saying, cultivate peace. Make peace. Don't just sit back and hope it happens. Remember, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. He didn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. In other words, you have to make peace. You have to do something about it. So when Paul said, live in peace with each other, what he meant was, seek where there are troubles and problems and do your best to settle it. Warn those who are idle and disruptive. When I went back to the original Greek on this, because Paul wrote this in Greek, I kind of wish they would translate this a little bit different. The word warn here, by the way, is the exact same word for admonish that we saw earlier. So admonishing or instructing in the faith and encouraging people to live lives in accordance to our faith, that's something we're all supposed to do. So we're admonishing the idle and the disruptive. Okay, so the word that Paul used here, this is actually the only time in the New Testament we find this word. It's not a very common Greek word. It is usually meant to describe soldiers. Soldiers who, um, well, either they don't hold their position in battle or they don't follow orders. So they're the ones, say, for example, if you're in battle, they panic and they retreat and flee. Or they're the ones who are subordinate. In other words, these are people who kind of create chaos around them. So, we are to admonish or correct or instruct or warn people who are causing that same kind of disruption or chaos in the church. Maybe it's their irresponsible conduct. Maybe it's retreating from the faith or, you know, falling away from the faith. Maybe it's people who just don't do anything in church. Just like a soldier doesn't follow orders. Maybe it's people who kind of stir up problems. Admonish them. The point here is not you have to be the little soldiers and march in lockstep with everyone to do exactly the same. The point here is, as Christians, we have standards to live by. Being part of the church comes with expectations. Next, encourage the disheartened, help the weak. I kind of put those two together because I think they are talking about the same thing. Think of people whose lives are diminished or people who are struggling. Maybe they're struggling physically. Maybe they're struggling emotionally or spiritually or mentally. Encourage them. Lift them up. Help them. Support them. Do what you can for their lives to be better. Be patient with everyone. Patience is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Gee, I wish I had more of it. Patience means persevering. 
don't give up on someone. It doesn't just mean being patient like, well, I'll wait till I catch up, but maybe you know one of those disruptive, chaotic people we just talked about. Maybe you know someone who doesn't know the Lord. Be patient with them. Persevere. Don't give up. Stick with them. What he's saying here is nobody is a lost cause. Make sure nobody... Oh, I skipped one. No, no. Make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong. Uh, in other words, this is like what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. If someone strikes you on the cheek, what are you supposed to do? Turn the other cheek. It used to be eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, and he said, no, don't do that. That's what Paul's saying here. Don't pay back wrong for wrong. It's similar to what Gandhi once said in response to what Jesus wrote. An eye for an eye will only make the whole world blind. So if someone does you wrong, that doesn't mean you have a right to wrong them back. Instead, always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. I really wish Paul hadn't put those last four words on there. Always strive to do what is good for each other. That would be us here in the church. Let's, let's help each other out. Let's do good things for each other. That, that's pretty good, isn't it? We can do that, right? No problem there. It's easy to do what is good for people who are like you and for people that you like. But you're also supposed to strive to do what is good for everyone else. That's a little different, isn't it? That means we are to do good for those people who are not seeking what is good for us. It means that we do good for people that aren't like us. It means we do good for people we don't like. It means we do good for people who don't like us or want to be around us. A little harder, isn't it? All right, doesn't get any easier as we keep going on here. These three are put together. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. These are three things Paul's saying that we should be doing all the time. Let's say them together. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. In a way, they're kind of related to each other, aren't they? Because when you're praying, you can be giving thanks. When you're rejoicing, you're praying and giving thanks. Now, it's one thing to try to pray all the time. And that's kind of hard, though, isn't it? I mean, you might wake up in the morning and say, today, I'm going to pray all day. And by pray all day, I don't mean walk around with your hands folded and everything. But always go around just being aware that God is with me. And I can talk with him. And he's, he's, he's here with me. We can start the day doing that, right? And then the day goes on. And we had all sorts of distractions that come up. Give thanks. This is a prayer that, believe it or not, even non-believers lift up. If something good happens, what do they say? Thank God for that. They don't even realize it, but they're praying. But to rejoice always and to give thanks in all circumstances, I can think of lots of situations where rejoicing and thanksgiving are the furthest things from our minds. And yet Paul is saying, even in those situations, you will find a way and a reason to give God joy and to give him thanks. And when Paul wrote this to the Thessalonians, he wasn't telling them to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. We know from the book of Acts that before Paul came to Thessalonica, the city before Thessalonica was a city called Philippi. And when Paul was in Philippi, he was arrested, he was beaten within an inch of his life, and thrown into the darkest dungeon. And we know that when he was in jail, in the middle of the night, guess what he was doing? Praying and singing hymns. Paul figured it out. With God working in our lives, maybe we can as well. Do not quench the Spirit. Don't extinguish the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't try to blow him out. Don't try to put out the fire. The Holy Spirit will move and act however he wants. The Holy Spirit will do things in ways that we don't expect. The Holy Spirit will do things in ways that we don't even think are appropriate. The Holy Spirit refuses to play by our rules. He manifests himself in extraordinary ways. So as soon as you think you know what God's doing, as soon as you think, I know how God's going to handle this situation, I can pretty much guarantee <laughs> you got it wrong. It's going to be something different you never even thought about. Do not quench the spirit. 
Keep your life open to God's surprises. Now, of all the things that the Spirit does, Paul did mention one in particular, prophecies. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. Um, a prophecy is when someone speaks words that were inspired by God to guide people, to correct people, to comfort, maybe to reveal some things about who God is. When someone does so, <clears throat> treat them with respect. Take what they're saying seriously, because they're words that are coming from the Lord. But at the same time, test them. Because you might have someone up here who's saying, this is a word from the Lord that I'm telling you, and maybe it isn't. You can test what people are saying is God's work, because guess what? You have the Holy Spirit at work in your life as well. Don't take anyone's word for it, especially mine. I do not want to be the kind of preacher that, hey, well, Peter said this, so it must be true. No, Peter said this. I'm not sure if I agree with him. I need to study this a little bit more and figure out what I think myself. That's what Paul's talking about here. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Literally, Paul is saying, avoid every appearance of evil. It's not simply enough to do good, which that's pretty hard, isn't it? But don't even let there be a doubt that maybe you're doing something wrong. Well, that's a pretty intimidating list, isn't it? Um, do you think you can handle it? Do you think you can do it? I don't. I don't think I can follow all of these things that Paul just went through. And that's why Paul ends with a promise. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. That is, make you holy. Make your life pleasing to God. May he work in your life so that all these things we just talked about, may he work in your life so they all describe you. And not just do it on the surface, but may he do it through and through. May every part of what makes you who you are, your spirit, your soul, your body, may all of them be pleasing to God. And when Paul wrote this and said, may God do this for you, it wasn't just wishful thinking. He backed this wish up with an assurance. The one who calls you is faithful and what? Did he say he might do it? Did he say on a good day maybe you'll see God do it? Does it say God will do it for a couple of people? God is faithful. He will do it. He will work in your life so each day more and more it is more pleasing to him. Now we have seen throughout Paul's letter, if you remember in 1 Thessalonians, the whole way this summer, we keep hearing hints of Paul talking about the fact that Jesus is coming again. That is the hope we're all living toward. That's what we're putting our faith in. And so Paul ends by saying that we can trust God will do his work in our lives so that when Christ comes, he will find us to be blameless in his sight. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you for your servant, Paul. We thank you for the way that he was faithful to you, and we thank you for the way in which you guided his words. So take our reflection upon Paul's words, and by the power of your spirit, Help us to live them out in our own lives. Amen.